merrily, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, make a note, in the, uh, put a note in the chat to all participants, by the way, if uh, the sound is ever not terrific. So, um, my deep dive into the four million mark records for archival materials that are in WorldCat has done a lot to satisfy my inner geek, uh, given that I'm an archivist and special collections librarians with decades of fairly fanatic interest in description and cataloging of uh, special format materials. Um, and that has included working on development of quite a few standards over the years. At least some of that must be true for you too, because while well, you're here. Um, I'd like to think that some of you are attending because you'd like to know whether it might be possible to make some changes in your practice to improve the effectiveness of archival description and discovery. So let's get down to it and say some of your curiosity. Um, here's how we'll proceed. We'll uh, look at some of what I found in my study of these records, all the while keeping in mind why the, why the data might matter. It can't just be about our geeky, purient interest in obscure data points. Uh, what difference does it make if the archival control byte isn't universally used? or if most materials other than uh, normal archival collections are cataloged as single items, or if the wrong type of record is used for websites. So in general, as we go through, please be thinking about what actually matters and why and what we can do to change practice where it's warranted. For this presentation, I'm going to assume that you all speak in MARC tags, though I've included the meaning of most tags in the slides for those who may not. The report we'll be publishing early next year will be intelligible to those who don't know Mark, such as um, archivists who have worked principally with EAD. But for webinar purposes, I won't be able to go into um, explanation of Mark's overall structure. By the way, I won't be reading the slides. I'm going to rely on you to skim them while I talk about selected points. And um, as Marilyn mentioned, the slides and recording will be available soon. And all of these, those of you who are here will be notified when that happens. So what did I set out to do? Here it is, establish a detailed profile of MARC data element occurrences in archival catalog records, providing a year of 30 plus years of practice. That 30 plus starts in the 80s when um, the MARC format for archival and manuscript control was implemented. The specific points on this slide are some of the things that at the outset of the work I thought might come out of the data analysis. So we'll see how that went. And please do take note of this fact that this study looks at field occurrences only, not data content. This was complicated enough and that would be really challenging. So these questions posed by me to me early in the project are in part a more detailed spin on some of the points in the previous slide. I'll be offering answers to all but the last one. Relatively speaking, I know quite a bit about linked data and the semantic web due to the fact that some of my OCLC research colleagues are among the most expert of the experts, but what I know is a drop in the bucket and doesn't qualify me to speculate very much. Some of you here today are actively working in this area though, and I'd love to hear some your thoughts about it either today or after the webinar. Uh, you know who you are. Now let's look at OCLC Research's answer to that first question. What is archival material? Many of you know that um, we host and develop the Archive Grid Database of Archival Descriptions, um, which was first designed by our colleague Bruce Washburn and continues to be improved and tweaked under his leadership with Merrilee's assistance. It's an amazing uh, research testbed for our thinking about how we can make the most of existing descriptions to maximize effective discovery of archival content. In order to build archive grid, Bruce, Bruce had to write specifications for a filter to select the WorldCat records that describe archival material. The four points on this slide summarize its chief characteristics. Unpublished archival control, one institution, no published stuff, almost no published stuff. And this slide, which is a screenshot from Archive Grid, the URL is down there at the bottom, um, enumerates all the little nasty bits. Uh, and implicitly, this is a big hint that it's not straightforward to scope the data set of archival materials. Even if we had stuck to the record types for mixed materials, those normal archival collections, and textual manuscripts, all sorts of junk, and I really mean junk, um, would make its way through the filter, and even more great stuff would be missing. 
Um, I'd like to go back and highlight two points from the previous slide. Um, we expanded the scope of archive grid and filter um, two years ago to add more types of materials such as visual manuscript maps and some others. Those are archival materials too. Um, a user might re reasonably be expected to think they are. Um, and then the second point is that the filter isn't and can't be perfect. I'll just give one illustrative example of that from visual materials. Um, stereographs. Uh, which are those wonderful late 19th and early 20th century photographs in the stereo that appear in three dimensions when viewed through a stereopticon. Um, most of these were published, and so they don't pass through the filter if the publication information is included in a field 260 or 264. I don't have another great example um, of the kind of thing that is missing that we wish were present. Haven't figured out how to solve that one. Okay, so what do I think we've learned from this work that's significant in terms of either understanding the nature of the data that we rely on, in other words, can we rely on it in ways that we want to be able to rely on it, and also considering changes we might make in order to improve practices. First one, record type, um, is, which is leader six, is sometimes used incorrectly. Um, mixed material seems to be overused. Computer files is also overused um, for archival materials and integrating resources, um, in my mind, one of Mark's most obfuscating terms, which is where websites belong, um, is greatly underutilized by archivists. Um, silos, specialist catalogers re either aren't aware of or they consciously eschew some of the data points listed here on that on this slide under that point. Records describing, describing items. I was frankly amazed at the extreme percentages of item level records for some types of material, quite a few of them actually. And, and what's up with 25% of mixed materials records falling into this category of item descriptions? Um, I'll point back to my contention that this record type is overused. Format specific notes. Um, some 5XX fields were added to MARC to address a need voiced by a format specific cataloging community. But the data suggests that some of these weren't needed so badly after all. Um, but how little use renders a MARC field unnecessary? Maybe that's a next gen cataloging question. Archival control um, is an obscure little bite in leader eight that was added to mark when the erstwhile archives and manuscripts control format was deprecated during mark format integration back in the 1980s ancient history to some of you i realize its intended purpose was to bring together all the records for archival materials that would now be dispersed across the suite of record types if routine if, excuse me if leader eight were routinely coded for archival control our worldcat filter would need only one step but alas, 28% uh, bit better for mixed materials records. Archival descriptive standards. We can't really know how often these three standards are actually used because catalogers may not always add the code in field uh, 040 subfield E. We can only know how often it's explicitly um, specified and the answer is not tremendously often. Um, linked digital content, there's lots of it. Um, one third is more than a million records. Much of it is visual material, um, and a lot of that comes into WorldCat from content DM users. And some of it is, of course, finding aids. The incredible, uh, we can't know which is which. Um, well, it'd be really, really hard to figure it out um, because we know from work that our colleague Ray Tennant has done that the data in A56 meals, uh, field is uh, subfield is, is a mess. Okay, so I wanted to give that overview of what I see as um, key outcomes before going into the data analysis so, um, so that you would have that stuff in mind. Uh, and I wanted to stop for questions in case anybody has any at this point. I know it's usually hard to have questions this early in a presentation, but here's your chance. I'll write that data analysis. Here's the order in which we'll go through it. Um, after looking at a few characteristics of the overall data set, I'll proceed through the types of material in descending order by representation. 
in the data set, which means visual materials, the winner by a nose will come first. So um, the 4 million records, you can see some of their uh, overall characteristics. Again, I'm not going to be reading the slides um, or highlighting every point, but rather the things that strike me as the most important or surprising. I've included roughly the same data elements on each of the slides as we go through the material types, so, and in the same order. So I'm hoping that once I've gone through a couple of them, you'll be able to skim them pretty easily. So take a look at the numbers, the second bullet for describing collections versus single items. Collection descriptions would have been a lot higher percentage before we added in all those other types of archival material. The numbers for uh, creator names and subject terms are pretty good. On the other hand, there are about 15% of records that lack one or the other. I don't have the number um, elapsed for those that lack both. So here you can see visually um, that descending order of representation in the data set. Um, visual materials nose out mixed materials by um, 5%. Wait, yeah, something like that. This is really tiny in these screens. Um, and then on down. Bibliographic level is uh, Mark's uh, concept for uh, the for whether a record describes a collection, a single item, or one of, a, of several other levels. Blue is collection. That tall one is mixed materials. Red is item. You can see how it predominates for the other formats. And the combined height of these columns gives you another view of how many records are present for that data format. Um, representations of subject and genre form index terms by type of material here. You can see at a glance that personal and organizational names as subjects are fairly uncommon, and that use of field 655 for genre form terms varies a lot across formats. OK, visual materials. I'm, I'm going to um, not stop for questions again until I get through all of the um, type of materials slides. So um, be ready for that. Okay, visual materials, um, which are near and dear to my heart uh, because my first job was in the Prints and Photographs Division at the Library of Congress. And greetings to everybody in the PNP conference room today. So, visual materials nearly a third of the records in the data set are for, data set are for two dimensional image materials, which are photographs, prints, posters, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, as you can see, item records greatly predominate. Field 007 is um, a MARC field that's used to record detailed specifications that enable very precise coding of formats, such as prints and photographs, um, and their physical characteristics. It could be things like the type of support a photograph is um, printed on, could be glass paper, um, or mounted on paper in a box, whatever. So, Fairly high use of field 520, the summary note is good to see, especially since so many records describe items. Um, we're at actually getting a bunch of great keywords, I assume, uh, both to tell us what the images depict and to expand discovery. So visual material specialists out there, does that 51% for primary creators seem on target? Creators are unknown for many photographs, for example, um, so it seems reasonable to me. Um, if you hear mewing in the background, one of my cats is unhappy. Go away, Barney. It's great to see how generous uh, visual materials catalogers are with their topical subject indexing, a mean of 4.2 terms per record. Genre form terms are ubiquitous, which is also really great to see since they're so powerful for specific visual formats. And look at all that digital content, nearly half of the records. And um, given that three quarters of the records describe items, I'm, I would guess that these are mostly linked uh, visual digital objects rather than finding a. Okay, mixed materials, the bread and butter of archival description. And it's the um, type of material into which all of those old AMC records were migrated. So three quarters describe collections, but that 25% said are items. Um, it seems to confirm something for which I've only had anecdotal evidence until now, which is that 
Some archives and libraries seem to use mixed materials as the type, no matter what type of material they're describing. Uh, content analysis of the data would be necessary to learn more about that, such as the extent to which collections consisting entirely of visual materials are, coding as, are coded as mixed. Certainly it's practical for training and workflow purposes, but not so much for consistency of a cross-institutional set of records. So, which approach do you take? And there on the slide is your sorry answer to the extent to which the archival control byte is coded for regular archival materials, 40%. Could be worse, but it's far from accomplishing the intended purpose of the archival control byte. Descriptive cataloging rules. Um, APPM and DAX are very rarely specified in descriptions of materials in other formats. For mixed materials, 40% may not be so bad. Uh, given that in the early days of AMC, it was pretty clear that many archivists cataloged, um, quote unquote, according to Mark, without paying any mind to um, APPM, archives, personal papers, and manuscripts, for those not familiar with it, apologies. I'd like to think this statistic would be far higher for uh, recent records and that DAX would be specified in a um, higher percentage over time. I was really surprised to see, only, to see that only 61% of mixed materials include data for a primary creator. I guess I've been misguided all these years in thinking that, in assuming that a much higher percentage has a known, of collections have a known creator, and only 20% have a secondary one. What's, uh, what's going on here? I'd, I'd love to hear people's thoughts about, about whether 40% um, of mixed materials collections without any kind of known creator um, makes any sense. As with visual materials, archival catalogers are generous with their subject indexing, or at least the 45% that include any at all. Um, so the records that include do include 650s are even more laden with index terms than the mean of 3.0 would suggest. And one third linked to digital content, which I would guess are primarily finding aids. That's surprisingly high to me in, in a good way. When I presented a quick precy of this work to FAA's Society of American Archivists um, Technical Subcommittee on DAX, descriptive, I'm going to blank, um, describing archives, uh, describing archives, a content standard. I looked at my book at the show. Um, so when I presented um, a precy to the DAX committee last summer, Maureen Callahan from Yale asked to what extent the DAX minimal element requirements are met. So here's your answer. Now, DAX was uh, first published in 2004, so one might argue that it hasn't been in use long enough for the statistics to be higher. On the other hand, that's a legitimate observation only for the last two conditions governing access in languages of the material, because um, in earlier rules, um, those weren't specified as necessary. Actually, APM didn't have minimum um, requirements. Then there are the date statistics. So who knew that so many archival catalogers use the 650 field instead of following archival rules and putting dates uh, at the end of the title? I didn't. Maybe these are records created by general cataloging departments rather than by archivists. Be curious to hear what people think. Um, so note fields that are used in more than 10% of the mixed materials records. Um, there are plenty more notes uh, that get used in some mixed materials records, but they're not here because it's under 10%. You can see that the only field that is used in more than half of records is scope and content summary. Um, so that's good, but there aren't any others that are really very impressive. And nearly half of the records have a general note, meaning the mean, that the meaning of that note is, or the nature of the content of that note is not specified. So that's interesting, considering how many specific ones, no fields there are. And uh, this all makes me wonder to what extent, okay, so not all note fields are relevant to every record, but how important is it to have a specific note field? What does that accomplish in terms of the uses to which we put our data? It certainly adds overhead for training and efficiency purposes. On the other hand, the addition of some of the archive-specific Fields probably improved some archivist's attitude about the library bias of Mark back in the early days. 
Um, actually, I think I'll I think I'll stop for questions here just in case. Um, since after talking about visual and mixed materials, that may cover a lot of your chief interest. Yeah, so Jackie, um, we have a question from Christine from University of Minnesota who says, um, and you might go back to that, that table you just used, uh, we use the 555U for link to finding aids rather than the 856. Was this dedicated field considered when determining the percentage of records with links to online content? Uh, no, I didn't look at that. Um, thank you, Christine. My sense has always been that it's really little utilized, but I actually have that number deep in a table somewhere. And if you'll send me a note, I will give it to you. So, uh, but here, and when we're looking at this, this table here for mixed materials, 21% um, used the, the note field, the, the yeah, 555? But, uh, what I don't have here is the um, percent of those uh, 555 fields that has a link. Right. Christine, is, your, is it your sense that uh, links in 555 are widely used? Can't be all that wide, because only a quarter of these records, only 20% of these records have a 555 at all. We'll, we'll give Christine a minute to, um, to respond. Uh, there's a question from Bob Kay from uh, uh, New York Public Library, and he says, uh, my perception is that decades ago, there was more of an effort to synchronize MARC with archival standards, uh, e.g. APPM. But since DAX and EAD, my perception is that the archival community is moving further away from MARC so that various 5XX fields don't necessar don't entirely sync with EAD tags. Do you have any comments actually, on that? Yeah, they actually sync pretty well, Bob. I'm looking down this list, and every one of them listed here, um, okay, maybe not every single one. Does language have an EAD tag these days? Yes, it does. Um, I think they sync pretty well. If you can point to any particular ones, or if anybody in the audience uh, can think of mark tags that don't have an EAD, I mean mark note tags that don't have an EAD equivalent, um, be happy to have you put those into the um, chat. Yeah. So Elizabeth, um, oh, I'm sorry. So Christine uh, responds. I'm not sure how widely it's used. Uh, this is regarding the 555. We've avoided. The 856, because so many types of electronic content are linked there, and our current discovery system doesn't deal with them in a way we'd like. And that's certainly something uh, that our colleague Roy has seen in his um, uh, dive into 856, is that the, the content is indeed very mixed and quite various. There is also um, a question from Elizabeth, who arrived a few minutes late and uh, wanted to know if the data was uh, EAD finding aids and MARC records in Archive Grid, and uh, for anybody else who showed up a little late, we're looking just at the, the MARC records, 4 million MARC records uh, that represent archive, archival content in WorldCat. Uh, um, so yeah, thank you. For, yeah, thank you for asking that question. And further, it's a study of field and element occurrences, not of the content of fields. So, um, yeah, that's the scope of the Study. Although I would mention that Marilee and a couple of our other colleagues in the research published a paper two years ago in Code for Live where they did an analysis of uh, element occurrences in EAD in the, um, at, at the time it would have been, I don't know, somewhat more than 100,000 finding aids in, um, that are linked to Archive Grid. So we have that work. Um, they also incorporated data that Kathy Wither at Simmons had done, a similar kind of study, but with a different data set. Um, and I'm hoping to be able to um, do a paper that looks at discovery issues, uh, taking into account both the MARC and the MARC records and the AED instances. Yeah, and I, I can post a, a, a link to that um, article into the, into the chat. Uh, Rebecca Gunther adds a historical note uh, that the 555U was added uh, to the format after there was wide use of 856, and some systems didn't utilize the link. Uh, sometimes people put the link in 856 because their systems didn't utilize the 555 $U. 
better practice, of course, would have been to use the more specific field. And of course, uh, you're perfectly right to note that um, a lot of the variation that we see is probably not only um, uh, shows uh, variation in practice, but also uh, what systems can and did and do support. Um, so I think that's a that's a good point. Um, so here's a question from uh, Jacqueline. Does this table regarding the use of note fields refer to description at collection level only, or the components deeper down, such as series or file levels? That's a really interesting question. It refers to all records for mixed materials. And uh, let's see, where are you? OK, so 75% of them describe collections, and 25% describe single items. There are very small. Uh, another bibliographic level uh, coding option in MARC is uh, subunit. In other words, if, for example, an archive's made a record for a collection um, and then a set of records for each series in the collection and then a sec sec set of records for some of the items in the collection, um, those the latter two would be coded as components rather than standalone items. Um, that component um, level cataloging is almost never done for mixed materials. So, um, yeah. So, in effect, uh, this is the this is the, the this table is the data for all the mixed materials records, 75% of which are collections, 25% of which are items. So, I'm not seeing any uh, any further questions at this time, but I would encourage people to please. Uh, continue to put their questions and also their observations and reactions to um, Jackie's own questions uh, in. And um, do you want to continue on, Jackie? Yeah. OK. OK, great. So textual, textual materials um, distinguished from mixed materials, and that's, in theory, all of the materials in the um, collection being described um, are textual as opposed to a mix of different formats. In this, um, in this area, uh, in this type of record includes two uh, distinct um, record types. Um, and we've included them both and let them both through the archival um, archive grid filter. 4% um, of all the records in, uh, of the 4 million are for collections of printed materials. And you might ask why we would let those into, um, let those through the filter. They could be, for example, collections of uh, books and pamphlets. Well, they might be housed in archives. Um, they might be perceived by users as being archival material. They might be managed archivally. I'd be interested in what people think of that. But the um, majority of these textual materials records uh, are for uh, textual manuscripts, supposedly. So um, two thirds of them describe collections, and um, a third or so describe items. Um, archival control uh, doing less good here than um, it was for in the mixed materials. Um, little less, little smaller numbers percentage in terms of use of APPM um, or DAC. The main number of subject access points is a bit lower for textual materials than for mixed, and I kind of wonder why that would be. Um, single manuscripts, sure, might have. Um, really limited, if any, uh, subject terms. But most of these are records for collections, so I'm kind of curious. And then there's a lowly 5% that have uh, links to digital content. That one surprises me as well, given how many of these are collections. Why wouldn't they be more often linked to finding aids like mixed materials are? I'm going to say a lot uh, less about the next three formats, mostly because I have very little experience with any of them. Any of those of you out there who are specialists with recordings, music scores, or maps um, would love to hear from you if you have anything to add to what I mention here. So um, as with a lot of the other formats, um, almost all of them describe items. Archival control is nowhere. Um, a lot of these records have that coded physical characteristics field because there's so many technical details associated with recording. Um, we, of course, don't know the extent to which, by the way, um, all of those very, very 
detailed um, 007 characteristics are used in any way by um, by the libraries and, and uh, archives that hold those materials. Um, maybe that's a next gen question to how important it is to track all that kind of stuff in VibFrame or schema.org, for example. So hooray for all of those uh, primary and secondary creators in these records. Wow. And then um, topical subjects, the highest, highest mean of all of the material types, 5.2 per record. That's pretty, that's pretty great. Almost no link uh, digital content. As with scores, almost all, uh, excuse me, as with recordings, music scores are almost entirely, well, I shouldn't say entirely, three quarters of them describe items. And this is the one type of material for which components are used with some kind of frequency. Um, it means that now a music cataloger can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but um, I mean, lots and lots of music is issued in parts, for example, violins, relative to an orchestral score. And so use of the component um, bib level and the appropriate mark fields to link it up to its parents and down to its children, if it has any, could be explicitly linked to um, those various levels, could be linked um, in a system that provided that capability. Um, uniform titles, um, one which is uh, one version of the title for materials that have are published in many versions with many titles. Um, really common in uh, record support music because so many different editions um, under so many titles are published for many, many pieces of music. And notes, uh, music catalogers stick to that general note. The composer is almost always known, logical. Topical subject is almost always present. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that um, genre form terms, this is true for maps as well, have um, always been uh, part in subfields, fields or subfields in um, uh, topical subject authority records. And um, for music, they have not yet been migrated into the genre form field, but that will happen. Um, cool to see how much digital content there is for scores. Maps, um, tiny, tiny percentage of what comes into the data set, but 22,000 manuscript maps isn't nothing. Um, almost entirely coded as, as items. So a mark includes a variety of elements other than notes that are specific to maps. That's kind of unusual across the types of material. Um, I'm wondering about that 20% that don't include a geographic area code in 043. Um, maybe that's minimal level descriptions, of which there are many for all of the types of material, by the way. Um, but it's clear that cartographic mathematical data is really important to map catalogers. Again, all the notes almost always in um, the 500 field. So there are three other types of material that come in through the filter um, in handfuls. And um, some of them have used the wrong record type and either shouldn't be there or um, there are, on the other hand, there are many, many thousands of records for websites that don't use the, according to Mark, correct um, record type. So interesting. And um, these are materials that come into, come through the filter only because they have specified archival control. Okay, questions. Yeah, we have, we have a few more observations um, from, from our audience. Monica from the fantastic Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, says that linked digital content can also be added to the 530. Um, and they have been using uh, the 530U for di linked digital content of items or collections that do not have an associated finding aid. So there's another place to look for um, linked digital content. And uh, have, you, have you taken a look at the 530U? Nope. So there's, a, there's another 
thing to look at. And then Bob. Um, yeah, but Mon Monica, um, as with uh, Christine earlier, if you want me to look that uh, up, I will, you know, just send me a note. I will put Jackie's email address into the chat window so you guys can uh, note that down easily. Um, and, it's on, and, and it's on the last slide. What? Sorry? And it's on the last slide. Yes. Uh, and Bob from NYPL notes that music has been uh, migrating genres from subject to genres as of earlier in 2015. Thanks, Bob. I thought it had started, but you're the one who knows. Um, Elizabeth uh, says, and I will post this into all um, I, all participants. I think this is only visible to host and presenter. Do you have a sense of the percentage of linked content that is finding aids versus digitized or born digital material? Um, I mentioned that our colleague Roy Tennant, um, who also has a substantial geek streak, um, has looked at 856s in part um, to see the extent to which there are broken links. Uh, the answer is 3% of the links in WorldCat are broken, um, which is considering that WorldCat has 340 million, let's see, oh, records, but uh, I don't remember the percentage of them that have links. Anyway, 3% broken. Um, but he also evaluated the kind of data that's in the various subfields. And first of all, few of the subfields are used frequently. There are a lot of 856s that only have subfield U, the URL. But um, the fact that the data is really messy and that the nature of the material is often not given means that we it would take um, some content analysis to uh, very messy content analysis to get the answer to that. I mean, I think you can conclude, you know, I make some assumptions based on the type of material, which may or may not hold water, but for visual materials, um, mostly cataloged as items, I tend to assume that it's mostly visual digital objects. And for, um, oh gosh, born digital material, um, most of them are, well, okay, um, to the extent, we, I don't know the extent to which uh, born digital materials are described um, and have made it into the, through the filter because they are, would be almost entirely uh, described as using the mixed materials record type. So I just, I just don't know. And there's a uh, one more question from Gloria Gonzalez. Will your data be made available with the report? I'm interested in visualizing all of this rich info. Yes, it will. That's an easy answer. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, we encourage people to continue to uh, type those in for us. Uh, you want to continue on, Jackie? Yeah. So um, I'm very serious. These are my questions for you. Um, I would love to hear from some of you um, your thoughts on these um, these things. So in my key findings section, I called out some of the things that I think are um, significant findings. Um, how, um, you know, I, how many of those actually suggest uh, necessary change? Um, haven't really um, parsed it that way in my mind. To what extent had you made some assumptions about the nature of archival descriptive practice that are not borne out by the data? Um, when you go to Archive Grid and read those detailed specs of our filter, what do you think? Can you think of ways to improve it? Um, and then just what other questions have I, do I seem not to have asked that I should be asking? And then um, that question about next generation cataloging. Um, we hear that uh, Mark is dead, long live something else, and uh, we're going to be at some point um, relying on a, some, on a different, um, one or more different uh, schemas, if you will, for cataloging. So are there aspects of Mark that need not we need not bother migrating into those um, new environments, or are there data elements of some kind that are not present that would be valuable to include? Anyway, big question. So I'm 
you know, feel kind of on thin ice with these. Um, and they're not, uh, most of them are not exactly, uh, you know, um, hardwired. Educate, promote, educate, promote. So uh, are there recommendations that you would make after hearing this data and after in a couple of months reading this report? What would help you in your work to know? What would help you if community practice were broadly different in certain ways? How would that help you? We'll publish the report, as I said, early in 2016. It will include the data in appendices, so watch for that via our usual channels. Uh, as I said, I'm hoping to uh, produce a second report that would uh, compare mark, the market and EAD studies we've done. Um, no idea about other projects, but um, some possibilities. And uh, actually, when it comes to uh, descriptive practice for web archiving, we will we um, called for volunteers from the OCLT Research Library Partnership, got a bunch of them, and will in January be launching a um, working group to talk about or try to develop some kind of um, accepted practice for describing web archives. Okay, so let's have some meaty discussion. So Monica asks, um, did you look at RGA and the use of 336, 337, 338, and 264 as RDA and library catalogers would expect us to use? Uh, she is particularly frustrated by needing to use multiple 336, 337, 338 for collections of truly mixed formats. <laughs> um. First, tackling RDA. Um, RDA was coded in as the descriptive standard used in 1.5% of the 4 million records. Um, to what extent, okay, and we know that um, really only in for mixed materials and textual manuscripts records do we see archival descriptive standards being used. Um, I had one of the slides that was by mentioned that um, about 60% of the 4 million records specify AECR2 as the content, content standard that was used. I don't have data to parse that out in terms of, for example, how often AECR2 is the um, standard specified for mixed materials. I mean, I, I, you know, that's, I didn't dig that deeply, um, but, uh, and also some of the formats uh, don't have uh, archival rules equivalent. Um, if there are such rules for uh, maps, um, scores, and recordings, I'd be very happy to hear about it. In fact, any of those of you who are experts in those areas, um, I'd love to have your take and your questions on the data. In terms of three, three, six, seven, and eight, uh, yes, they are, uh, vexed. Um, and the uh, my sense is, when I've inquired about those, the various people in the know, is that the lists um, are there to be available for expansion. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly they haven't been interpreted or, you know, developed or interpreted in a way that would deal with the well, with the mixed format issue, um, I don't know, is it kind of like how many subject headings they're going to put on, or, you know, um, personal name access points am I going to put on a record for a large archival collection? Got to stop somewhere. Um, so I, uh, uh, I, I don't have a whole lot to say on that. I can tell you that um, 336, uh, 7, and 8, are three of the fields where OCLC's um, amazing quality control um, group has been um, automatically adding those uh, based on record type information and such like that in the cases where they are straightforward. They, so far they occur in a fairly um, small number of records in this data set, probably because in large part they're not so straightforward. And then 264 has um, also a very um, small number of occurrences of that, but partly because um, the filter removes uh, any record, so, you know, uh, records that have subfield A or B that publisher place of publication. 
do not come through the filter um, as the chief way of getting rid of a lot of published materials from the archival data set. So um, they're not, so those two fields are not used very much. Let me know, uh, Monica, if that didn't answer your question properly, but I, I don't really have a whole lot more to say. So uh, we have a couple more questions. I'm going to take them a little out of order because some of them are a little more philosophical in nature and other ones get to kind of cataloging practices. Um, uh, Christine um, says that she likes the idea of automatic, automated data remediation, um, and this pertains to the, uh, the, the uh, pro prolif proliferation of various notes fields. Um, however, she would be cautious about eliminating dedicated note fields as they would be more easily mapped into linked data environments if they were parsed out rather than lumped together in the generic 500 notes. Yeah, Christine, I would be very cautious too, and certainly it's not in my power to do anything whatsoever about this. To me, it's mainly a question of um, thinking about them in the context of um, linked data and whether um, that set of data elements sort of um, warrants being replicated. The answer may well be yes. You know, they're all used at least some of the time. There are a few that are very, very, very um, um, occasionally used. For example, there's one for awards that the collection has won or exhibits that it's been featured in, the item, you know, that it's say a um, important photograph has been featured in. Those are almost never used. Um, but yeah, I would be cautious too. Um, automated data remediation, uh, OCLC does a lot of it in, uh, but very cautiously, for example, um, altering subject headings to have them, to modernize them in accord with Library of Congress authority records. But, um, you know, any uh, contributing institution can, of course, do its own. Um, but for some of the kinds of things that might be warranted for archival materials, for example, that, um, what was my number, 10%, I think, of the mixed material records have one of those lovely old generic titles, such as papers, comma, 1743 to 1812, um, or records, same thing. Um, and as opposed to the George Washington papers or um, the records of uh, Planned Parenthood. So um, trying, to, uh, trying to create meaningful titles that would be useful within, for example, a browse list, um, I suspect that would be a really tough thing to pull off, but certainly something that any archive could uh, you know, could do if it had the time and inclination. On the other hand, a lot of considering how many um, very high percentage of records added to WorldCat these days are added by batch loading of a file from a contributing library or archives. Um, and um, if you load, for example, changes to your archival records by that means, it's not going, the changes are not going to be made to the master record. So the only, if you want to make changes to your rec archival records and have um, those changes, those improvements display and, you know, be part of your master record in WorldCat, you need to do it in WorldCat. And that's something that, um, it's my sense, doesn't tend to happen. So we have uh, two questions that fall into the kind of um, advice column uh, uh, category. Perhaps we should start an advice column called Dear Jackie. Um, the first one is, Dear Jackie, one argument we have with some archivists is the archival nature of published materials. If they have been annotated, we consider it archival, but other archivists say no. Is this resolvable or up to the determination of the individual archivist or institution? You know, uh, I'd say it's up to you. Talk to your colleagues elsewhere and see if you can come to some kind of agreement. Um, an annotated published book, I would consider it a book, um, a collection of those that are hand, that are treated archivally um, because they all are annotated. Um, I'd be inclined to do that as a text, you know, collection of textual or mixed materials. So, I mean, I think it's, yeah, well, enough said. Yeah. Here's our next Dear Jackie question. Dear Jackie, 
Should extent information for collection level records include both cubic linear feet and number of items in the 300? I'm just going to say read DAX. That's what I would have Because that, I mean, that's not, you know, it's not my opinion. Uh, my opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> Frankly, we have, uh, we have a standard called DAX. We have a we have a vote to have a dear Jackie column on hanging together. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps we can continue this um, as a as a spinoff of this. Um, so Gloria uh, says this may be outside your scope, but I've been looking for statistics on the number of repositories that consistently create collection level records for archival collections, whether the collections have finding aids or not. Do you have any suggestions for where I should look for this kind of information, or is that something you can include in a future survey? Um, let me just wrap my brain around this for a second, Gloria. The number of repositories that consistently create collection level records. So this is this is kind of a tricky one for us to answer. We would, uh, of course, turn to WorldCat to look for people registering creation of those records, in, at least in terms of MARC. Um, if you go out to the community and do a survey, you have to start somehow with a list of repositories, and that could get, be quite tricky. So, it's, uh, one thing you, one thing you could do, Gloria. Oh, were you done, Marilyn? Yeah. One thing you could do, and you know, this would not be any fun, but uh, within Archive Grid, you can um, scope your search to a particular institution and then you can scope it to the type of record you want to look at. So you could scope it, for example, to UCLA um, type of record, um, MARC records, which actually, ironically, uh, the code is type AMC. So you could, you know, go, say, to a sample set of those institutions, and there are, how, how many contributors are there to um, Archive Grid these days, merely? 1,500? 2,000? Yeah. Um, anyway, so you could go through um, an institution's records and see what they do. Or you could, um, I mean, there, Gloria, if you want to get in touch with me or even have a phone call, I could show you how to do that in Archive Grid. All the instructions are there on the About page, but it's pretty obscure if you haven't done it. Um, anyway, so you could, you know, just sort of do your own on-the-fly research based on finding aids that have been, uh, or excuse me, the MARC records that are in um, Archive Grid, same data set as this one, by the way, as we saw, and, um, and just kind of play with it. But in terms of the number of them, you know, um, the name of contributing institutions is in MARC Holdings records. And I actually don't know anything whatsoever about uh, our, about, um, our, meaning OCLC's, ability to uh, bring together, say, type of record information with holdings information. We would never make that public anyway. Um, I mean, you know, just it's not kind of the kind of thing that, that uh, you know, numbers of institutions, sure, but I don't know if that's even possible at OCLC. So uh, Chris from the, from the Hagley um, provides a very, uh, interesting illustration of why they use uh, mixed materials, and it has to do with um, uh, what their OPAC insists uh, that they do. But but it comes down to the big distinction is between published and unpublished materials, um, and uh, they consider the OPAC and not WorldCat as their catalog of record. I'll let people who uh, who are interested in that that read. Read that, but that's a it's a it's a good point. I think I don't know if you have uh, further. Reading. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at it, Chris. Um, jumping to the end, AMC was more truthful. Um, AMC uh, didn't capture a huge percentage of the stuff that's um, in this data set, for example, uh, because if uh, an institution just used AMC for all of its um, archival visual materials or whatever, um, you know, then it's not represented um, in that data set. Uh, published versus unpublished, boy, such a tricky business, isn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I think I'm going to go there. And the horrors of all the different ways in which OPAC software deals with record types in terms of being able to scope um, searches or whatever. Yeah, what a mess, huh? 
lobby your well, what a what a what a what a hopeless thing to say, huh? Lobby your OPEC. <laughs> I am not seeing any further questions, um, so this might be a good time to wrap up. Uh, I did want to say thank you to everybody for your great uh, questions, uh, comments, and observations. The reason that we uh, are doing this Works in Progress series and the reason that we offer it to others at other institutions is because we think it's um, really important when we're in the middle of our work to pause and to present the work while it is in progress so that you can um, have some input into it and help to shape it. Um, so you guys have done a, a, a fantastic and stellar job of doing that. And thanks to Jackie for um, bravely presenting her work in progress. It's not always easy to present it when it's not uh, neatly tidied up, but I think that this is a useful thing to do. So. I'll thank you, um, remind you again that the recording and the slides will be available on our website, and, um, and we'll get going on the Dear Jackie uh, column. <laughs> uh, advice for the, for the Lovelorn catalogers. Uh, so thanks to everybody, and this concludes